fast-moving counterattack as Ukrainian forces recapturing nearly 1,200 square miles of territory. This is in the northeastern part of the country, and it's happened in less than two weeks. That's more land than Russia has been able to conquer over the last five months. Ukrainian forces taking back and liberating several key towns, receiving hugs, as you can see, from locals, and little resistance from retreating Russian troops. But despite those gains, Russia has launched new airstrikes in the region today. CNN's Melissa Bell is in Kharkiv for us. So, Melissa, help us understand the significance of what's happening at this hour. Well, really quite extraordinary to say, not least for the people in those villages who've been liberated after six months of occupation. And bear in mind that in those villages where it's sufficiently secure that investigators can get in, speak to the people and work out what's gone on, we saw some of them do just that yesterday, what they're finding sadly is uh, signs of possible war crimes. Investigations have been open. You'll think back to Bucha and Borodyanka. Russian troops had been in those parts to the north of Kiev for only a month. Here they've been for six months. And so over the course of the next few days and weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. But the places where they can get in that are sufficiently secure that, say, the police and the war crimes investigators can go and start their job are really at just at the very beginning of what was this extraordinarily fast-moving eastern offensive. It has continued. It began last week. Those early successes now the subject of investigations and research. But as you move further eastwards to some of those key towns, you realize that actually even in the places where the Ukrainian flag has been raised and it's hard to get to them, uh, there is still fighting going on. We managed to get to uh, Kupiansk only yesterday. The Ukrainian flag had been raised there 24 hours before. Have a look at what we came across. Aircrafts, helicopters, shells, everything. A first artillery strike. Too close for comfort. Then a second. Much closer. So Russian forces are trying to keep hold of those key strategic towns in parts. Uh, but as you say, what's extraordinary is to watch that advance continue. And what we've seen over the course of the day is more Ukrainian gains so far south that Ukrainian forces have now crossed the Seversky Donetsk River. They have now taken a village in Donetsk province to the south, and that is extremely significant. Really, those advances continuing very fast, but it's important to remember, uh, not at no cost. This is, these are extremely difficult battles in some of those key towns, uh, but still, those forces managing to move forward, and I think no one, not least the Ukrainians, anticipated that this eastern offensive would be as successful as it's been. And part of that, Alison and Victor, was the cleverness with which the communication was dealt with. Remember that they launched their counteroffensive to the south at the end of August, kept that under tight wraps, then launched the ones here in the Kharkiv region in the east, and it is that one that the Russian forces were guessing were simply not ready for. And it is that one that is making, making the most extraordinary progress, as you say, taking back so many of the parts of the country that were taken by the Russians in April and May, now apparently back, for many of them, in the hands of Ukrainian forces. Alison, a victim. Melissa, what do we know about the conditions of these liberated towns after months of being under the control of these Russian forces? Well, as I say, the ones you can actually get to where there isn't the kind of fighting I just showed you are pretty few and far between. They're the ones at the very beginning of where the Eastern Offensive began just a few days ago. One of the ones we visited yesterday, we've just been hearing from Kharkiv prosecutors who've opened four war crimes investigations. We watched the body of a civilian being dug up, a civilian allegedly killed, signs of torture on him, killed by Russian forces in the very first days of the war. And it is that picture of what's gone on on that side of the line that was maintained for so long. Not just uh, angry troops, as we saw in Bucha and Borodyanka, carrying out unspeakable crimes against civilians, but a much more systematic attempt to control an entire population with all kinds of abuses against civilians, part of a strategy by Moscow to keep these towns on that side of the lines, draw them into the Russian Federation, hold referenda. And what prosecutors in Kyiv have been telling us is that they're hearing about, and they've been investigating these crimes, even from the other side of the line these last few months, a much more systematic attempt to put in place a totalitarian regime, clean out the areas entirely with all the brutality you could imagine. 
Melissa Bell in Kharkiv there for us with some uh, fantastic reporting. Thank you very much. Let's bring in now retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Peter Zwack. He served in Moscow from uh, 2012 to 2014 as the U.S. Senior Defense Official and Attaché to the Russian Federation. General, welcome back. Uh, are you surprised? Now, we've heard about the logistical and the morale challenges of the Russian forces, but 1,200 square miles in just a matter of weeks the Ukrainian forces have been able to retake. Does that surprise you? I am uh, surprised at the scale and the speed of what looks to be almost a meltdown of Russian forces uh, in and around the Kharkiv area. And uh, this thing could be contagious. Uh, the word gets out. Um, um, I, 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 yes, uh, saying that, uh, I mean, we saw how, how, how effective the Ukrainians have been as fighting fighters, their will and passion for their nation that really, really emerged, and a lot of the new weapons that have come in to buttress and support there. But yes, this is uh, rather extraordinary. I would put a cautionary tale. Uh, I always worry about uh, overextension and, uh, and, um, uh, and then leaving yourself vulnerable. But no, this is quite something. And so in terms of overextension, I know that you say that the South is key. It's existential, you call it. And Melissa Bell, our reporter there, just said that they've made they've made remarkable gains in the Donetsk region. So what would overextension look like? I mean, can they now start trying to take this out? Well, I think that, uh, again, we have what the Ukrainians have, which means I believe they need to to aggressively but carefully continue to push up in Kharkiv but also now continuing their pressure that they're putting uh, down um, along the Harrison area. Um, yeah, they need to push. They need to be, uh, they, they just need to be not overextend. But again, there's an aspect of the Russian defense, especially up, up in, uh, uh, in Kharkiv and how it now is beginning to hit Russian positions lined in Donetsk of kicking a rotting door down. Um, uh, so uh, we remember one thing in 2014 and 2015, and I think the Ukrainians remember it well. They did have a counteroffensive in Donbass, um, and, and, and they overextended, and the Russians were able to push them out. So I think all of this is a swirl, uh, the chaos of war, but the, but the uh, Ukrainians, clearly, initiative, motivation, will to fight, and the Russians show none of that. General Zwack, do you think that this uh, continued territorial loss uh, makes uh, a singular, punctuated, escalatory attack more likely to come from the Russians to try to save face here? Um, this is, uh, this is uh, turning out to be a really rotten endeavor, no matter what the uh, disinformation and narrative in, out of the Kremlin is for, for the Russians, for Moscow, for the military. This is embarrassing. It's humiliating. And yes, it is now, in my mind, become... There were two existential fights, Victor. One is for the survival of the Ukrainian state as a free-minded, and it looks like it's going to happen. The other one is what is the, is the, the, uh, the Kremlin and that state, and this is existential. The, uh, the, 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 the you know, the already, the, the wolves are baying. We're seeing protests. There's a disgruntlement in the military. Ramzan Kadurov, the Chechen strongman, is out publicly. And this does concern me because there is a backed in the corner aspect of this thing. These things are contagious. Hmm. If it continues this way, you get more and more Russians. You, read, you just read um, a CNN report. 18 provincial leaders have come out against the regime, against Putin. This is cascading. This could make the Kremlin desperate, and they do have a range of possibilities um, in, of, of major, major, you know, increasing violence uh, up to, you know, brandishing. Nobody wants it, but brandish, brandishing in the very, very worst case, uh, a, a no, nuclear back off. We have nukes aspect to this. Mm. Yeah, that part does, I mean, one of the parts that you just talked about does seem so surprising of the 18 municipal deputies feeling free to criticize and call for Vladimir Putin's 
resignation. That is different inside Russia. Uh, retired Brigadier General Peter Zwack, thank you very much for all of your expertise.